board. And I don't know if I need a little bit more volume, perhaps. Uh, I want to, first of all, thank God for the opportunity to be here. And I would like to thank Pastor Ward and, and Betty Ward for this opportunity to speak before you. Um, let's just get started. When I was growing up, uh, and this might date me, but there was a saying, if someone said something to you that was sort of um, hurtful or, or not very nice, the phrase would be said, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And as I became an adult and thought about that, I thought, that's not really true. As a matter of fact, that's categorically false. And not only is it false, but it doesn't line up with scripture. So it's not scripturally based. There are several things in scripture that, that teaches us how the power of the word operates. Uh, scripture tells us in Proverbs 25, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Proverbs 15, 4 also states, a gentle tongue is a tree of life but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. And Proverbs 11.9 says, with his mouth the godless man destroy his neighbor. Destroys his neighbor, but by knowledge the righteous are delivered. So words do have power. The words we speak carry great significance. Proverbs 18.21 states, the tongue can bring death or life. That's, that's power. So there are power, there's power in words. Many years ago, um, and perhaps I was probably, I think I might have been in high school when I heard this story, but many years ago I heard a story about two patients. And in fact, it's a, it's, it's a true story. One patient had a terminal illness and was only given um, a few uh, weeks or months to live. And another patient did not have anything that was um, any serious diagnosis and he was expected to leave the hospital soon. However, the diagnoses were switched. And so the doctor's reports came in for the man that had the terminal illness as if he had nothing, and the man that didn't really have a serious illness, he got the report that he had a terminal illness. As a result, the man that had the terminal illness and was expected to die lived, and the man that had nothing really seriously wrong died. Words matter. Words have consequences. Words, in fact, have power. Uh, the, the word of God is also a creative word. So we're, we're going to look at how the word has power and we'll look in this lesson at how the word is also creative. So we, we want to debunk this, the, the saying, and I don't know, young people probably, I don't know if you've even heard of that saying, but if you're a little bit older, you, you've heard of that saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That, that is definitely not true. Words have power. And so we need words in order for us to be able to walk this life in a healing fashion be able to live this life in a healing way. Now, let's talk about a little bit of, about what happens in life. We, we go through life, and life is about joys and triumphs, as well as disappointments and sorrows. And at some point in life, everyone experiences sorrow and anxiety. And 
the, the level or the depth of it varies, but everyone experiences sorrows, fear, and in fact, in fact, anxiety. And the proverb that we will examine today is an admonition to speak a good word to those who are experiencing anxiety. And before we read the scripture, let us, let us pray. Lord God, we are so thankful to have this opportunity to worship you today. We are so thankful for this opportunity to uh, be in a place where we can worship freely. God, we thank you for the freedom of worship. We thank you that we still have the freedom of religion in these United States. Lord God, help us not to squander that freedom. Lord God, we pray that as the word goes forth, that it will fall on good ground. Lord God, we ask that you will touch hearts. We ask that your healing virtue will go throughout this place. Lord God, we ask that you will help us to not just be hearers of your word, but help us, God, to be doers. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 28. And I'm going to read it from the ESV. And it reads, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. And this idea is that uneasiness or apprehension, fear, causes the heart to become heavy. But good words from others will lighten one's load. Life will bring about worry, life brings about apprehension, life brings about fear. But as believers, we have the ability to speak a word of encouragement. How many of you all have ever been down and a word came to you just at the right time? We have that ability as believers to speak a word of encouragement. Furthermore, we not only have that ability to speak a word of encouragement, but we are told to do that. The Apostle Paul told the Ephesians, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So we not only have the ability to do it, but we are told this is what we should do. We should speak a good word. And so today we will examine Proverbs 12, 25 to see how we encourage one another during times of anxiety and fear. Because when we do this, we are repairing a heavy heart. When we speak encouragement to, to someone with a heavy heart, we are performing heart operations. So I'm calling this word Operation Heart. We'll examine three things. First, we'll look at who experiences anxiety. Second, we'll examine the remedy for the anxiety. And finally, we'll look at the effects of a good word. So first, who experiences anxiety? It might surprise some of you to know that everyone experiences anxiety at one time or another. And everyone experiences a heaviness of heart. Everyone has the experience of, of sorrow. This is not something that is unique to just one person or just unique to a few people. This is something that is a part of life. And so it brings me to the point of sometimes Satan will try to get you to think that you're the only one. One of Satan's favorite lies is to tell you you are the only one experiencing this or no one knows how you feel. And so you take that lie in and you'll say to someone, no one understands me. No one knows how I feel. But that's a lie. Scripture teaches, teaches us that 
Jesus experienced every temptation that we experience. Hebrews 4.15 states, This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So you are not alone. Do not buy into the lie that you are the only one experiencing heaviness or sorrow and or anxiety. You're not alone. Our scripture text um, in the first part, 1225a, says anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. And I want to note first that this is not a conditional statement. There are some statements in the Bible that are conditional, so it depends on one thing, or it depends on something else, or if you do something, something else will happen. But this statement is not conditional. This is a definitive statement, meaning the writer of Proverbs is saying anxiety, basically, this will happen. Heaviness of heart will happen. And when it happens, it weighs the heart down. In other words, it weighs heavy on us. The term anxiety in the Hebrew means heaviness or sorrow. And great heaviness tends to cause us to stoop. As a matter of fact, in the King James Version, I like that version because it states, it says it like this. King James Version says, Proverbs 20, uh, 12, 25, like this. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop. So the depression or the sorrow causes the heart to bend. The King James Version gives a brilliant imagery of the heart being heavy to the point where it bends low. I remember as a kid, my father um, often took my siblings and me on fishing trips. And we'd be out in the boat casting our rods. And we knew a fish was on the line when the line started bobbing and particularly when it started to bend. And the extremeness of the bend indicated the size of the fish. Sometimes our fear or sorrow is so heavy that our hearts actually bend, and it bends very low. It weighs us down. We see a vivid example of this when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was praying. And the Bible tells us that it was so heavy on him that his sweat were as drops of blood. That's heavy. That's sorrow. So we sometimes experience deep heaviness to the point where, like a fishing rod, it's bending down. And depending on the weight of the sorrow, depends on how great you feel that your heart sometimes is bending, is stooping, as the King James Version says. And sometimes anxiety can cause us to lose peace. And this is when it's important to remember that we can pray. As believers, we have an advocate with the Father, and so we can go to Him in prayer when things cause us to be heavy. When the weight is so great that our heart is low, we can go to God in prayer. And the, the church that I grew up in, we, we sang a lot of hymns, and I like hymns because the hymns remind us of scripture oftentimes. And hymns often speak truth from scripture. And one of the hymns I remember singing as a child was, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And one of the verses says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. 
When our hearts are bending low, when we're, when we're feeling like the world is sitting on our shoulders, one of the things that we have to remember to do is go to God in prayer. And as we pray, let us look for someone we can encourage in this walk. Because we all experience anxiety at some point in life, it is good to remember that at our Christian, uh, in our Christian walk, we are meant to be in community. So this means we are meant to help one another on our Christian journey. Amen. And so the, the Proverbs, the writer of this Proverbs understood that because he said that we will feel anxiety. Sometimes our hearts will be low. But when that happens, a good word is an encouragement. And so we want to remember not to buy into Satan's lie that we are all alone. The enemy would love us to keep things to ourselves. Have you ever been through something so, so difficult that sometimes you just want to keep it to yourself? You don't even want to share it with anyone. This is what the enemy wants you to do. Satan wants you to keep it to yourself. But we should tell someone so that they can come along and help us. They can come along and give us a good word. And also, because we live in community, we should not be off by ourselves. Ecclesiastes tells us that two are better than one. For when one falls down, the other can help him. And there are many other examples in scripture that teaches to this point that we live in community and that we help one another. For instance, in the book of Exodus, I believe it is, Moses' father came and encouraged and helped him. In the book of Ruth, we find Ruth and Naomi helping and encouraging one another in their difficult times, in their times of sorrow. Another example we find is Elijah helped and encouraged Elijah. And as mentioned earlier, one of the greatest examples we have is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and the Holy Spirit helping and encouraging him through that most difficult hour. So it is a biblical principle to help one another. It's a biblical principle to live in community. And we are talking about encouraging and lifting the heart. And so we want to remember that we live in community, and if we're talking about an operation, we're talking about heart operation, the word helps us, as a good word helps us, but how many of you have ever seen on TV or any documentary about surgery? How many people are in a surgery room? Is there just one doctor there? there are, there's a team. And so whenever a doctor performs surgery, he has a team around him. It's the same for us. If we are going to help one another, if we are going to encourage one another, if we are going to help heal and lift hearts, we do it in community. When something is overweighted to the point that it bends, for example, the fishing rod, when, when and we, this didn't happen often, but when we were fishing with my father, if we caught a big fish, my father would have to help us bring it in because the rod, the rod, the line would bend so that we could not bring it in ourselves. And this is how it is for us living in community. When one of our brothers and sisters are heavy in heart, it takes a team to come around. It takes a team to give a word, to encourage. It takes a team to help to pick up the heavy heart. And so how do we do this? By giving a good word. So now we, we understand that at some point in life, we all fall into this situation of having a heavy heart. We all fall into the situation of having anxiety, sorrow. And so now let us look at the remedy that the writer gave us. The second part of the verse 
provides a solution to the heart that is bent. And so a good word is, sorry. Let's look at the second part of that uh, verse, 1225b. So now it tells us that a good, when the heart is heavy, a good word cheers it up. In some version it says cheers it up, in some version it says um, it makes it feel better. It depends on the version you're reading. But a good word to a heavy heart is a cheering process. It cheers it up. And so a good word is like a successful operation on the heart. When you have successful heart operation, the heart begins to function normally again. The heaviness is lifted. The heaviness leaves. And the heart can function again. I want you to notice something here, too, in the second part. The writer gave the specific instructions for this remedy. He said, a heavy heart is cheered how? By a good word. And I found it interesting that this word good is the same word we find in Genesis when God created the world. So God created, the Bible tells us, light. And then he said, it is good. The same word here. And then the Bible tells us that he created the land, the dry land and the sea. And he said, it is good. And everything he created, he said, it is good. So I find it interesting that this writer of Proverbs uses this same word to say, this is what cheers a sorrowful heart. This is what helps bring a heart out of the depths. Not just any word, but a good word. And so we want to look at that a step further. The, the Bible tells us that God created everything. And so it was a creative word. And so when we're encouraging someone, when we're helping someone, when we're giving someone a word, we want to give them a good word. We want to give them a word that is creative. A word that is going to heal. So we're using the same word that that the writer that the writer of Genesis, Moses, wrote good. And so this Proverbs writer says, a good word is going to cheer the heavy heart. In other words, we encourage one another with something that is edifying, something that provides healing. So for this, the remedy to lift our heart is a good word. Uh, I, as a missionary, and, and I, there are some missionaries I know that are here, um, but missionaries, we have some things that we dread, and one of the things in being a missionary, one of the worst things that could happen is to become sick. Because we are far from home, and we are far from what is familiar to us. And during my second year as a missionary to Russia, I was invited to visit Israel. And I had a wonderful time there. As a matter of fact, we stayed for about six weeks. It was a wonderful visit. But halfway through the trip, I became very ill. I caught a flu bug. And I became so sick that I actually told my friend, please contact my family. I don't think I'm going to make it. And, and I was very serious. I, I said, contact them and let them know I, I think I'm about to die. And I wanted to say goodbye to them. I honestly thought I was dying. That's how sick I was. And so my friend's mother, she said she wanted to give me a remedy. And the Russians had quite a few <laughs> remedies. <laughs> and, and this remedy 
included vodka and pepper and milk and and honey and and they stir it all up and it, it it's you know it it doesn't sound appealing neither is it is is it pleasant uh, and so my, my, my friend's mother wanted to give me this remedy. But I told my friend I didn't want to take this remedy. But after several feeble attempts, I took the remedy. And I often joke that I don't know if it were the prayers or the remedy, but the next morning, I was completely healed. Uh, so I accepted the remedy and it cured the illness. Remedies bring about relief and healing from whatever afflicts us. And so the proverb writer, he, he gave us the diagnosis. The diagnosis was, is a heavy heart sorrowful heart and it's so heavy that it's now bent over but he also gave us a remedy and the remedy seems simple enough but sometimes we refuse it the remedy for anxiety or a sorrowful heart is a good word we live in a world where people have heaviness and anxiety but often, they refuse the remedy. The good word is that the heaviness can be lifted if you receive the good word. Even as believers, we sometimes refuse the remedy. And this being the Advent season, this being the time that we are talking about good cheer, we're talking about uh, having peace, and we're talking about having hope. This is the time to give a good word. Some 2,000 years ago, Mary was given a good word. That she would give birth to the Christ child. And that was a good word to Mary, but it was a good word to all of us because this word spoke to the world. Jesus would come and he would live and die and he would save us from our sins. This is a good word. This is a healing word, but we have to accept it. We have to accept the remedy. Jesus is the best remedy for the world today. Okay. But how many of you all know that many people are refusing this remedy? <laughs> many years ago, uh, there was a singer by the name of Andre Crouch. And he sang, he wrote and sang a song, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other, Jesus is the way. And so today we are living in a world where sometimes people are refusing the best remedy there is. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How many of you, how many of you know that is a good word? Amen. So then how do we use this good word? When we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, the Holy Spirit fills our lives, and guess what? The Holy Spirit is a comforter. So now we accept the good word, we invite Christ to come into our hearts, and we've got the comforter living in us. That's a good word. And so we need to share this with everyone we come in contact with. When we share this, we are sharing a good word. When we share that God sent his only son, 
we're sharing a good word. When we share that Jesus came and died, Jesus came and lived, and then he died, and he rose again, we're sharing a good word. And so, what are the effects of a good word? First, it brings healing and life. Isaiah told us that we are healed because Christ was whipped on the cross. Isaiah 53 says, but he was pierced for our rebellion. Crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. And guess what? We have the power to speak this word to others. The power that is in us is the same power that was in Jesus Christ. And so if we can get a hold of this, we can be an encouragement to many people. We can be an encouragement to the person that we meet that's heavy in heart. When we can get a hold of, we have this power living in us. We have the power to speak comfort. We have the power to speak peace. We have the power to speak a healing word to someone that is full of anxiety or sorrow. Second, a good word encourages. We can all give a good word to those who are heavy to encourage them. And so we are in this season to celebrate the best news ever received. This is encouragement. Let's encourage one another with this good news. Some 2,000 years ago, the, the angel came to Mary and Gabriel told her, you're going to give birth to a child. And Mary was so excited. Mary, after she, I would imagine, got over her shock, she goes to the town to tell her cousin Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth, the Bible tells us, when Elizabeth saw Mary, she became excited. And the baby inside of her, who was John the Baptist, leaped in her womb. They were excited about what? About the good news. About a good word. Elizabeth rejoiced because of the good news that was about to happen. Jesus was entering the world. And Luke said it like this. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you what good news of great joy which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This is a good word. This is an encouraging word. This is a healing word. This, I would contend, is a creative word. So sometimes we are faced with circumstances that cause our hearts to sorrow and we are filled with heaviness, but we are not alone. This is not an uncommon occurrence, and most importantly, there is a remedy. The remedy is receiving a good word, a word that can spark life, a word that can ignite peace, a word that can bring cheer. And so, as I close, I'm going to ask you to do something. I would like everyone to stand. I want us to practice, I want us to put this into practice, giving a good word. As believers, we, we should practice encouraging one another. As believers, we should practice providing a good word to those who are experiencing heaviness. A good word can be a scripture. 
to encourage. A good word can be a Christian poem that lifts the heart. A good word can simply be God loves you. So during this season, when we are focused on the good news that a Savior was born, let us remember to offer this good news to someone else. Let us remember to tell it from the mountaintop, as the song says, that Jesus Christ is born. Let us remember to give someone a good word, because a good word is healing. And a good word provides encouragement to a heavy heart. Amen. I would like for us now to turn to one or two, three people. It doesn't matter. You can do it in a group. But I want you to give someone a good word. Give someone a creative word to encourage them. You, you, you can do that now. Let's, let's turn and give someone a good word. <laughs> 